You're listening to a health podcast, which means you probably care about health and you enjoy podcasts. I'm Dan Kendall, the founder of Health Podcast Network, and I want to invite you to join me and thousands of healthcare professionals and leaders at the annual health event taking place in Las Vegas, October 20th to 23rd. When you're there, I'd love to meet you at our exclusive reception on Monday, October 21st. In fact, the host of the show you're about to listen to plans to be there too. Reserve your spot. Visit healthpodcastnetwork.com slash health. That's healthpodcastnetwork.com slash H-L-T-H and save $250 with our special discount code. Again, that's healthpodcastnetwork.com slash H-L-T-H. I look forward to seeing you there. I'm Dr. Raj Sundar, and this is Healthcare for Humans, the show dedicated to educating you on how to care for culturally diverse communities so you can be a better healer and achieve better patient outcomes. This is about everything that you wish you knew to really care for the person in front of you. Let's learn together. Welcome back to our four-part series on caring for Ukrainians. This is part two, where we're diving deep into the Ukrainian community's health beliefs, challenges, and experiences, specifically in the American healthcare system. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I highly recommend you go back and check it out when you get a chance. It provides crucial historical context that will give you some background to help understand today's discussion. The question that maybe this episode focuses on is, have you ever wondered how a community's history shapes its approach to healthcare, or how language and cultural nuances can impact medical decisions? It's a question that we explore in almost every episode, But this one is going to build on last episode where we focus specifically on history and it's going to translate to what it means for Ukrainians' approach to healthcare. I'm joined once again by Tamara. As we talked about before, she's a passionate advocate for Ukrainian health. We'll explore topics ranging from the community's self-reliant mindset to the complexities of building trust in an all-new healthcare system. In this episode, you'll hear about how the historical context we discussed in part one influences Ukrainian health beliefs today, the challenges of preventive care, including vaccination hesitancy, and a firsthand account of a culturally insensitive medical encounter and what we can learn from it. Let's dive into part two of our four-part series on the Ukrainian community. Here's Tamara again. I did have one more data point that might be interesting. With some of the other partners we meet with in our Ukrainian and Russian work group with the Department of Health, we talk about the demographics of Ukrainians during a survey collection. If you are Ukrainian, you will check off white as your status in the racial profiles that are built into our demographics. When you separate groups in this demographic, Ukrainians who may have a different socioeconomic status as other white people in the region are clustered there. A lot of times in terms of programming and data collection and the impact of how many Ukrainians are here and what their needs, they can often be uh, lost in this big data set. And that's what some people have been trying to figure out. How can they be um, categorized so that we can figure out more data um, to help us create uh, culturally specific and culturally appropriate programming. Very interesting. And another way, our socially created idea of race (laughs) lets us down (laughs) and erases people, including Ukrainians, because the idea of just white people (laughs) is confusing for people checking boxes and you're from Ukraine and you're like, I guess I am. (laughs) It's not doing justice to the actual population needs. When you think of the Ukrainian community, one part of the history is the transition to becoming refugees because they were forcibly displaced at certain points in history. How is the word refugee perceived in the community? I haven't questioned people directly in terms mm-hmm. of how having that being named that is a positive or negative connotation. But what I have tried to do, and I know that a lot of people in our community do, is when referring to people who have come into our country in the newest wave, saying new arrivals has a better connotation, unfortunately, than refugee in a lot of people's minds means, oh, they might be suffering. There's that pity and looking at that person as lesser. They might need things and be struggling, all these negative connotations. So I try to just allow people to be who they are. They're newly arrived people working on 
their identity here in our country. They may have needs and gifts that they're bringing to our communities. That's a conscious thing. I hear a lot of people in our community and organizations who serve Ukrainian refugees and other refugees having that name referred to differently so that people aren't making that connection that they're needy, things that are really negative and usually not completely true anyway. Yeah, there has to be a way to provide support, which many people do coming to a new country without it being burdened by pity and sometimes condescension and anger and contempt, which happens especially in refugee immigrant communities and our political climate, reiterating the importance of language and focusing on what the community wants to be called by. And some people maybe want to call by refugees and you have to make room for that. But this idea of new Americans, I've heard that too, or new arrivals, I think I can definitely see the importance of using language like that. Yeah, I think of my parents and all the things they had to go through from being displaced and coming to the country and having that refugee label that doesn't help to empower you when you're trying to work on creating your new life. Yeah, exactly. I would like to talk about two things. Tell me what you want to focus on with the idea that we'll have future episodes focused on both health beliefs and mental health. We could start with general health beliefs because they inform mental health beliefs. So let's transition to health beliefs. There's a broader sense of beliefs in immigrant and refugee communities when they come to Western countries. It could be US, Canada, wherever, where there's a specific way we think of healthcare with insurance, complicated systems, referrals. When people are listening, you're like, yeah, that's how healthcare works. But when you're coming from different countries, often it's one clinic in their town that they go to for everything. It's a true contrast for many refugee communities. Each community has their own beliefs around health that can lead to what at times we feel like conflict with our current beliefs or meaning Western. Uh, Americanized healthcare. I'm speaking as an American clinician when sometimes maybe you were talking about preventive care and it's, it's we don't feel like we're communicating that. But just starting out talking about that, Tamara, the question is doing this work for you, what health beliefs have you noticed in the community that you've tried to amplify versus be a mediator when assimilating in some ways into this new way of doing healthcare? but not sacrificing important parts of what health means for the community. Thank you for having this podcast because I've listened to episodes that have informed me about how to relate to a specific community based on their values, traditions, and needs. So I think that's very important in terms of uh, providing health care to have those perspectives. Um, And I think uh, for Ukrainians and new arrivals coming to this country, they're coming from a different system. And they're trying, especially if they're refugees, to survive. I need to have shelter. I need to have food. I need to take care of my kids. I need to get a job. Ukrainians have a history of self-reliance, of that Mm -hmm. independent, I will take care of myself. The government and other entities not taking care of me and have actually harmed our communities. If I need to do something for me and my family, I will try to be self-reliant because I have to. That's a very big concept for people who are Ukrainian. They're proud of that. I will figure this out. I will solve this problem and I will do it independently or with other people from my community that I can trust. And then branching out from that, how is trust being built? And when will that occur in terms of having non-Ukrainian health providers and other people in the community supporting? Not to say that Ukrainians don't accept that or are open to that at all, but that is how historically it's been seen. I saw it with my own family. My mom was very focused on getting health care because we did have insurance when we were growing up after my parents were working, but my dad didn't choose to participate in the healthcare system in, with dentists or doctors and didn't want to have any of those services. So there's that deep rooted, like you said, from generation to generation, independent self-reliance, mistrust providers need to consider that's something that they will need to build by building a relationship, building a, a trust, and that person is wanting to do the best for themselves and their families. Yeah. Thank you. 
definitely we need to start there that people are making the best decisions they think for themselves and their families, even if it doesn't make sense to us. I think there can be a conflict there and sometimes we approach it in a negative way of either forcing it without consent sometimes in the most awful ways, but also I think how we react sometimes with condescension or I think paternalism for communities. Let's use specific examples and that may be helpful. Many communities have low rates of preventive care and it's also true for Ukrainian communities of vaccination and mammograms. I think two different examples, but maybe in the same bucket, you're doing something to prevent something in the future. What health beliefs inform that decision in the community? And what does it mean to keep a community healthy um, and work with those beliefs? Great questions and two great examples. Specific to vaccinations, uh, Nashi Immigrants Health Board, that is one of the missions that they've taken on with their work and their grants is to disseminate health education that is culturally appropriate in language for our Ukrainian community to increase vaccinations here in the United States. What I was talking about earlier in terms of government mistrust will play largely into the vaccination process. Ukrainians are self-reliant and how the mistrust in government has caused a lot of areas of health care to be affected, including campaigns to vaccinate. So that's been an issue for our community. What we're seeing with the work we're doing with Nashi Immigrants Health Board is that there are certain vaccines that are more troublesome to the Ukrainian community. They are worried about side effects and harm being done to them or their families by being vaccinated. They often think that outweighs the risks of attaining the disease. This may also have to do with if within your history you've been able to not be ill from a specific disease that is often in your community, then you feel like I don't get that disease or I don't have to worry about that. And that may be also people's thoughts that let's wait until something happens before we intervene. And this is somewhat of a logical perspective when you think, okay, I feel great. When I feel sick, I will make an intentional move to help myself. I visited Ukraine in 2006 and I was doing healthcare research, visiting hospitals and interacting with physicians, nurses and other healthcare providers. The last place they wanted to go is the hospital. Compared to here, people go because they know they need a surgery. There is a very different system and there is a place that people aren't looking to do prevention. I can't speak for now, except for the colleagues that have talked to me about it, but that has been some people's perspectives. So why seek that out earlier than you need to? So that's an issue. The other problem is the sharing of false information in social media. That's become a huge problem, unfortunately. We are experiencing this, but in Ukraine, And among Ukrainians, uh, there are areas of social media that can inflate things or share false information that healthcare agencies have to dismantle. They'll have that process of of having people accept those healthcare practices. Um, But a thing that could be recommended is when I do patient care is asking people what they think about a specific intervention. What are your thoughts about vaccinations? Body language speaks loudly. People don't want to really engage just to get an idea of where they are, what their baseline is, and that you can form a relationship around that versus just giving information and saying these are the requirements, which may decrease trust. So always forming that relationship, asking questions. Ukrainians are really proud of their knowledge base. There's a lot of Ukrainians who've had the opportunity to undergo a higher education and they want to be. Uh, knowledgeable about some things, not talking as uh, uh, an authority and healthcare provider thinking, oh, my patient isn't going to know what I'm talking about because I'm the provider and I have privilege and I've learned all this. Chances are, if that encounter happens, the person's going to be like, I know about this too. And I have a few different thoughts about it, but I'm not going to share them because this person's just telling me what they know and they're not listening to maybe what I might think about this. That's human too. What have you found that's helpful for 
anchoring on what's true. I think sometimes it's like I'm competing against a social media clip or a family member who experienced a real side effect. I'm talking about theoretical percentages and risk benefit calculation. But what's real is, hey, I saw them have a side effect from this vaccine. They were in pain for two days. Their arm looked a little red and they said, I wouldn't do it again. And that was a real experience. And that's a risk of a vaccine. Very small, but we think the benefits are greater. This relates to what informed decision making really is and what healthcare sometimes doesn't do justice in communities like people who are educated and want to make informed decisions for themselves. What have you found that has been helpful? Some of the things that I would list as the top facilitators would be to provide in language consultations. I know this is difficult in our country. There's multiple languages people speak, but if someone comes to you in your own language, the trust goes up so much higher. I think it's because the comfort is there. I don't have to think about the words I'm going to use because it's my native language. Um, Having that availability increases the trust and may increase the effectiveness of the message. That's pretty huge. The other thing that I've seen um, that has been really helpful is the community health worker, the medical assistant who is from that culture and that community making a huge impact on the community's decision-making. I have three people in my mind right now who collaborate with Nashi who are those people. And I can't say enough about how they get people call them privately. People ask them questions before going to the doctor because they trust them from having that relationship, that language, and that support. So that's another way I think communities can bridge relationships with providers to make them stronger. I've heard this in different presentations with vaccination specifically, but repeating the message is if you want to build trust and the first encounter you have, you don't get the results you need as a provider. They didn't want to get this vaccination today. That doesn't mean they won't. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe they just met you. Maybe the trust isn't there yet. Building the relationship has been shown to provide for people to comply with health information and health advice based on trust. Keep trying to forge the relationship. Ukrainians traditionally have a family doctor they trust that has this decision making with them that are able to influence some of the health decisions that they have. So they have that model is familiar. So that may be a place where you can build that over time. Yeah, I think that's really important to call out. It takes time to build trust, to talk about vaccines and even preventive health like mammogram. Now, taking the other side of this question, what are the main health challenges and concerns within the community? Because we're saying vaccines and mammogram are important and then saying prioritize these, prioritize this. But I think it's important to also think about what does the community feel like is important for them? And maybe part of this work is addressing that first before even talking about the preventive care that we feel is important. Yes, that's really important to call out. People have become more health conscious over time in Ukraine, as I said, in the time of independence and modernization of ideas around that. But if you talk about older generations, their perspective is, and this is from my own thesis I conducted with older adults, to them, taking care of all their health needs isn't such a priority because they're closer to the end of their lives and they're not afraid of that process. A lot of people have a really strong faith and they also want the younger generations to be able to thrive and have that opportunity to be healthy. So that's a perspective they often take. In terms of demographics and disease processes, hypertension and heart disease are large factors of chronic disease for those older adults and communities. And cancer is increasing as well in terms of the awareness and the the fact that if you live longer, there may be more probability that um, you will um, get a cancer diagnosis. Now, when we think about younger folks, we've done some community assessments with NASHI Immigrants Health Board, seeing that uh, the younger groups, more middle-aged and young adults, some of their biggest needs were for anxiety Allergies were also one that came up in some of our data and just mental health support needs. Those were always flagged in some of our community assessments as being on the top of the priority lists. 
differing data in terms of the importance of an in-language provider. The longer you were in the country as an immigrant, the easier it was to have a non-Ukrainian speaking provider. Whereas if you're newer, it's just much more comfortable. I'm going to ask you the question that I ask most folks who come on this podcast. Have you had a personal experience or your family had an experience where you were treated in a culturally responsive way that others can model? Or the other question, uh, which sometimes people choose to answer is when it all went wrong and you said, don't do this. And that's your advice for folks. Is there anything like that you feel comfortable sharing? Yes. Um, unfortunately, it's the latter. So the negative experiences, because I use them as a learning experience to see how things could have gone better. Um, I can um, speak to a specific experience where I was translating for a Ukrainian patient it, going to a primary care doctor for the first time for cough, uh, lung issues, uh, respiratory. I signed up to go to this community health center near my house. They said, I don't understand English. Can you just be on the phone while we do this appointment? And I said, yes. They had to wait in the parking lot because it was during COVID-19. They weren't given instructions that they understood. They were like, this seems stressful. I am not allowed to go inside. And I was telling the person, you know, this is just how the policy is right now. You have to wait. So then they went in and the doctor and there was another provider in there. I don't know what their job was, but they were doing all the vitals. They were getting basic stuff and they started the assessment and the greeting. I said, I'm going to translate for them um, because they are newly arrived. This is their first appointment and they're having respiratory problems. They did the assessment physically. When they started discussing things, the provider decided, okay, this is probably a virus. And the patient coming from Ukraine maybe had an experience where an antibiotic was prescribed for them or their child and they got better. So I'm hearing from the patient that the doctor isn't listening. They're like, I've been coughing. Is it productive? All the questions and looking to listening to the lungs. And the doctor is not listening because I was privy mm -hmm. to that part of it where they had their decision made. The patient was wondering what your thoughts are on antibiotics because they feel like they've been sick and their family was sick and they're not getting better. And they have a child, they have hundreds of things they need to do within their lives. They have no yeah. energy. And they said, I'm not going to discuss that. That's not a choice that I'm going to make. But mm -hmm. that became tension because the openness just closed off for both of them. So I said to the patient, well, the doctor doesn't want to do that. This is their rationale and talking about antibiotic resistance. <laughs> OK, this doctor is against me. I don't want to continue mm -hmm. this appointment. And the doctors could send you for a chest x-ray, but that isn't a good idea, but I'll do it to cover themselves. In my opinion, I yeah. did all the right steps. And the patient, the next time I was on the phone with them, they were back in their car. They just walked out. Mm. And what I saw from that was completely negative. So the relationship and the encounter was very negative. Will that woman go back to the doctor? I don't know. Will they be spreading a disease if it is something that can be spread? They weren't educated around any of that. And they were really angry. <laughs> and hurt by the encounter. So that was one of the most recent negative ones that I experienced that could have gone a lot better. I was trying to advocate and I kept repeating, this person is newly arrived. This is a new environment. And there was not time or interest by the providers to make that encounter better. I, I think I have my thoughts on that. I'm curious on what could have gone differently because it's such a common experience. Unfortunately, many people have experienced that. From my perspective, I'm going to be as generous as possible for those listeners, especially those clinicians who are getting the tightness in their chest, maybe some defensiveness. Hey, I only got 15 minutes. I hear you. You're very short on time. But there's a sense of I made a decision because it doesn't sound like you have a bacterial infection, so you don't need antibiotics. And what you need is just time. There's nothing more we can do. I think that clinical part can be absolutely crystal clear, but you can deliver that message with a lot more kindness and understanding and make room to listen where the patient's coming from, which I think we maybe dismiss quickly rather than maybe they're like, if you actually made room for it, they're going to talk about how antibiotics did make them better last time. 
there's going to be some tension, some disagreement, but maybe less anger, this feeling of not even listening at the end that I heard from that. What could have gone differently? I agree with what you're saying. And I also wanted to add that you mentioned that the patient had an experience where antibiotics helped them and they are newly arrived. So that was in a different country. That is key to how they're seeing the value of different parts of healthcare and how that helped them or their child. So taking that into consideration is super important. Every provider wants their patients to be healthy and feel well. There are these nuances where instead of making that judgment and delivering it that way, there could have been more of a back and forth conversation around what is the patient feeling and experiencing and what are their experiences related to healthcare when they had a respiratory infection in the past? There was not any conversation around that they're newly arrived. They happen to be from Mariupol. If you know the history of recent Ukrainian war, that was a city that was in, uh, under siege and destroyed completely. People are traumatized from experiencing that. You just don't know where someone's been or where they are, but asking a few basic questions in a kind way before you start the treatments. You may disagree with patients, but having both of you come to a place where I respect and listen to your story. I disagree as a professional, but thank you for sharing it with me. It, may, it meant a lot to me to know it. I agree. I think it's really important pe for people to reflect on their practice. And if you're a healthcare professional, how you're designing systems to make room for the humanity piece of caring for people outside of just the clinical medicine. Thank you, Tamara, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening to Healthcare for Humans. If you've found any value in this podcast, I have two quick requests. One, please leave a review in the podcast app that you're listening to my voice in right now. It really helps others discover the show. Two, share this episode with anyone who you think might benefit from it. For easy access to all our episodes and to support the podcast, visit www.healthcareforhumans.org. There you'll find our content clearly organized topics, countries, themes to help you choose what to listen to next. Until next time, this is Dr. Raj Sundar reminding you that culturally responsive care leads to better patient outcomes. See you again soon.